president of Succeed Together. Thank you all for joining us for this online version of the fourth annual Succeed Together Montclair Living Festival. We have a great lineup. So if you haven't already done, I hope you'll sign up for more of our terrific events today and tomorrow. The festival is a program of Succeed Together, a nonprofit based in Montclair, New Jersey, that provides free educational services to low-income children in Essex County. If you'd like to support the tutoring and enrichment programming, you can donate via the link in the chat. Today's books are available for purchase through festival partner Wachang Booksellers. You can click on the green button at the bottom of your screen to purchase them. The authors appear for free, so please thank them by buying their books. If you have a question for today's speakers, you can click on the ask a question bar on the bottom right of your screen. We're thrilled to start our festival this morning with a fiction panel on outsider women narratives. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Lori Lico Albanese, author of two novels and a memoir, Stolen Beauty, wonderful book, Blue Suburbia and The Nell by the Sea, and is the co-author of the novel, The Miracles of Prato. She's taught creative writing to all ages, including donating her time to succeed together, Stephen, and has worked in book publishing and journalism. Lori, thank you so much for moderating this thank session. You. Thank you. Good morning, Marcia. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here supporting Succeed Together and the Literary Festival. I am so excited to introduce our three panelists. We have <laughs> Mona Awad, the author of Bunny, Lauren Akampora, the author of The Paper Wasp, and Laura Sims, the author of Looker. Hi, guys. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so this panel is a fiction panel called Dark Matters, Outside Female Narrators. And I have spent the last couple of weeks with these books being entertained, thrilled, frightened, and sort of feeling a little bit like I was looking in the mirror sometimes. <laughs> so I am really excited to get started. I'll do a brief introduction for everyone. Lauren, Lauren Akampora, the author of The Paper Wasp, was published in June 2019 by Grove Atlantic. Paper Wasp was named a Best Summer Read by The New York Times, Home Magazine, and many others. It was long listed for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. Uh, Mona's debut, I'm sorry, why does it say that? That's really weird. Um, that's Lauren, sorry, they, it ran together, Mona. Mona is the author of Bunny, published by Viking in 2019. Bunny was a finalist for a Goodreads Choice Awards for Best Horror and for the New England Book Award, selected as a Best Book of 2019 by Time, Vogue, Book Riot, uh, and others. Her first novel, 13 Ways of Looking at a Fat Girl, won the, which I love that title, that's crazy, uh, won the Amazon Best First Novel Award and was a finalist for his Bush Bank Prize. Mona uh, is a visiting writer at UMass Amherst, right? And um, lives in Boston. Lauren, sorry, I cut you off there. Lauren lives in Westchester with her husband and her daughter, right? Yeah. yeah. And Laura, Laura Sims. Hi, Laura. Hi. Her, debut, her debut novel, Looker, was published by Scribner 2019, named the best book of 2019 by Vogue Esquire UK and the Star Ledger and best book Best New Book by People, Entertainment Weekly, and others. And Looker has been optioned for TV by Entertainment One. That's really exciting. Laura <laughs> is also a poet and has published four books of poetry, which are lovely. So these three books, Bunny, The Paper Wasp, and Looker, are, as I said, they're beautifully compelling, sort of frightening uh, satires about the lives of women who are driven to the breaking point fundamentally, right? Because of envy or a deep sense of competition or some sense of unworthiness. So I've spent a little time with you guys and you all seem like highly 
you know, functioning, stable women. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You don't need to speak to that one way or the other, right? But um, you uh, written these about these women who are driven to insanity, basically, by feelings of envy and desire, and you know, sort of the desire for this imaginary life they think that they should have. So I'd like to ask you each to sort of introduce your narrator. Um, uh, why don't I start with Mona? Mona, you're right up here. Um, Bunny, uh, Lena Dunham says, Bunny mounts one of the most pristine, delightful attacks on popular girls since Clueless. Um, and so Mona, can you introduce Samantha, our MFA student for us? Yeah, um, so my main character is, uh, her name is Samantha Heather Mackey, and she is a creative writing student at um, a New England Ivy League college, and she feels very um, alienated in that environment, very much a fish out of water. And her peers are these girls who have formed a clique, and uh, they, are, they call each other Bunny, and Samantha is not part of that clique. And so she hates them. Um, and they kind of don't really love her either. <laughs> but she's also really drawn to them in spite of herself because they have things that she doesn't have. Um, one of them is money. Another is a, a different tier of education. You know, they come from a different class. So they've had access to things that she hasn't had access to. Yeah. Um, and so the, the book is really exploring the dynamic between um, Samantha um, and her own insecurities around everything that the bunnies bring up yeah. and um, her own desire and her own um, authentic self and what she truly wants. Um, so, yeah. So Mona, I wanted to ask you, you went to the MFA program at Brown, right? I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, started there was the, because the book takes place in Providence, Warren College, right? Yeah, you know, Warren, where the bunnies live. Did yeah, you work on oh, this. I just got that. Yeah. I think actually, one. Yeah, the Warren. I know, right? Yeah. Um, did you work on this book while you were in the program? No. Uh, the, my my uh, my thesis at, uh, at Brown was my first book, 13 Ways 13 of Looking at Fat Girl. That's what I came to work on, and I finished it there. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I did think to myself while I was there, this yeah. would make a great horror novel. Yeah. <laughs> and I wrote it <laughs> when I left. Yeah. <laughs> so. How was it received by your um, fellow MFA students? I'm, I mean, did you get a lot of feedback probably on both sides, you know, saying, yes, this is what it felt like for me in the program or a program? Or did you have people saying, no, was I one of the bunnies, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. A few poets came to like uh, a couple of my events uh, that came to, to the like, bunny events and they really loved it. And um, one of my teachers who was really important to me um, at Brown, Brian Evanson, he he read it and loved it. I, th I think everybody kind of knows that, I mean, the book is is not like a literal reality. It's oh, somebody's emotional right. and psychological reality. It's, yes. you know, um, so, so, and I think that it takes the piss out of out of this, these kinds of programs in ways that everybody, regardless of whether they benefit from those programs or not, can yeah. appreciate and kind of laugh at. Yeah, yeah, mm. right. It begs the question, are we all outsiders, right? Which well, I think we all are. RuPaul yeah. says that we all are inside. Yeah. Everybody thinks that they're an outsider inside. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the next, the uh, thank you, thank you. I loved your book. It was so entertaining and, you know, it kind of blew my head open. Uh, and I did an MFA program too, so of course we can all feel right. that. <laughs> <laughs> so the other two books, uh, Lauren's and Laura's, both uh, deal with women who are envious of women who are, are stars, right? Or who are actresses mm -hmm. and stars. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Which I, which I really love. So Laura, uh, the Wall Street Journal says, Looker is a sugar-coated poison pill of psychological terror whose wit and fluency cover its lacerating diagnosis of the deranging effects of envy, perhaps the most widespread social sickness of our age. Mm -hmm. So 
please introduce us to your unnamed, right? First yes. person narrator, which I thought was an amazing decision to make on your part. It's funny, it wasn't really conscious, but mm -hmm. looking back, I can say, oh yes, that was <laughs> that was a smart choice to make. But really it was, I didn't think about naming her. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really bad at names. And I huh. think I just let it be for a while, but then, you know, I, I just couldn't name her. Yeah. I, I just, it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. But um, yes. Did you have sure. a name in your mind? No. <laughs> no, just Looker. I just call her Looker, you know? Right, right. Looker. So okay. I don't have a name for her. So yeah. Yeah, my my nameless narrator, um, she is a woman who whose life has recently kind of imploded. She's uh, been trying to have a kid with her husband and gone through a terrible fertility struggle. And he's left her eventually. It's kind of damaged the marriage and he's left her. And they live in this area of what is also unnamed, but is very close to Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, uh, this area of the city where, you know, families are just everywhere. So she's constantly looking at what other people have and what she does not have. And the kind of epitome of all of this is her next door neighbor, <clears throat> excuse me, her next door neighbor who is a famous actress. Mm -hmm. And it's not only beautiful and successful, but also has this thriving family with three children and a happy, mar seemingly happy marriage. And so she kind of pours all of her want onto the celebrity and uh, feels, you know, less than because of it, or she already did feel less than, but. Yeah, and um, what was sort of your inspiration for that? I'm curious, I'm always, of course, I'm always looking for like the personal connection to the right. character. Um, did you live in Brooklyn? Did you? I did, oh. I lived in Brooklyn. <laughs> I lived in Park Slope for about 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. And it is an area where there are quite a few celebrities who are raising their families. And um, one of, and you know, so you would see them around and there's always kind of a little, you know, ooh, there's a famous yeah. person, right? So we yeah. all look at them and notice them even if New Yorkers don't act excited. But um, so one of these celebrities passed yeah. me on the street when I was like coming home from the grocery with 20 bags and getting ready to schlep up you know, four flights of stairs to my top, our top floor apartment. And she was just kind of floating down the street, <laughs> you know, oh unencumbered. She, she never had more than one of her kids with her, you know, like she was totally free and beautiful. And I just had this moment of envy, you know, uh -huh. that we would all feel, I think. Yeah. But after that, this voice came into my head and it was this woman who was not normally envy, envious. She was bitter and raging at the world. Yeah. I went home and put the groceries away and I started writing this voice out and that became, wow. that became the book. Wow. Yeah. So wow. it was like an intense moment of, of inspiration. And came out of a real feeling of- it Came out of a real feeling, yeah. Rage or- like, Yeah, I think- It was rage in you. Yeah. I think what's fun about these outsider narrators is, yes, we all feel those moments. Mm -hmm. you know, these creations, I think for all three of our books, you can kind of delve into it and just go you know, crazy with yeah. that feeling, yeah. like, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna ask all of you in a bit to talk about how it felt writing these books and how, you know, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear about that. I just want to say for your book, Laura, I loved the whole thing about the block party and how she's always thinking oh. about what she should wear. And then she shows up and she's never wearing the right thing. So I know, like, poor thing. Know, like, I'm the only person wearing black. I'm the only person not wearing black, you know? I mean, get I it right. that. yeah, shopping, shopping at like, cool um, secondhand stores and just always thinking she's going to be right and then I know. You know, not being right. I know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sure. So um, Lauren, the paper wasp, uh, there's, I, let me see, what do I have here? The paper wasp, uh, the New York Times says, take the talented Mr. Ripley, add a dash of La La Land, Mix it all at midnight, and this arty psychological squawker novel is what might result. 
So I, Abby, that's your protagonist's name, Abby. And I love, speaking of what to wear, Abby wears red, pe red pedal pushers, red pants. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Red capris, excuse me, right. I'm, I'm dating myself. Right. <laughs> Abby wears red capris. Um, I love how you chose the second person narrator. I thought that was just amazing. So can you introduce us to Abby and tell us a little bit about her, who she is and your inspiration? Sure. And you know, it's funny, I just want to say just to, uh, what Laura just said about being living in Brooklyn and going to the grocery store and being overloaded with all the bags and walking home. It's so funny. I wish that is exactly how I had my inspiration. Really? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> the resentment that comes from grocery <laughs> shopping on Atlantic Avenue. Oh. That's yeah. where I was living in Cobble Hill and uh, going to Key Food on Atlantic Avenue in the winter. Oh, and mine was like, summer. Mine was, oh, summer. was summer. Same effect. Yeah. Oh, miserable. I remember that. Oh, yeah, it's miserable. I mean, and for me, it was like, you know, and you can't, you have no car. So it's like you're having to carry them all. I, so my moment, the spark for my book came from uh, Key Food in Atlantic Avenue, being in London in the checkout, wearing my like my brown bulky winter coat and my, you know, you know, damp, my limp hair and hat and all that stuff and putting all the groceries on the conveyor belt and waiting and just feeling grimy and unattractive and miserable and looking at those tabloid and looking at those magazines yeah. and the glamorous celebrities, you know, the women who are all airbrushed and beautifully made up and living their lives, you know, on, and I had a couple of thoughts. One, and I've always been really fascinated by the story of Katie Holmes in particular. Yeah. She grew up in Ohio. Yeah. And she was just like a small town girl, whatever. And, you know, and sort of like, like launched to, to this unbelievable fame. And this, of course, the story, and I, I think it's true, I don't think it's apocryphal, that she had all these uh, posters of Tom Cruise on her bedroom wall when she was growing up and ended up course, married to him. And I've always thought about, she must have had a best friend when she was a kid who yeah. mm -hmm. also loved Tom Cruise and also mm -hmm. dreamed of the of this life. And what was it like? What's it like for that friend to see, you know, Katie Holmes is sort of just a placeholder in my mind for that sort of uh, sudden fame and launch to stardom and who gets left behind. And so I always thought about that former yeah. friend who's yeah. left in Ohio. Yeah. And um, that is where my narrator came from. Uh, Abby is, she grew up in a small, very small town, uh, rural Michigan and was very good friends with Elise Van Dyke. And she was always beautiful and sort of um, charismatic. And Elise ends up, Elise ends up as a movie star in Los Angeles. And Abby is left behind, even though she was the valedictorian of her high school and has uh, dreams of becoming a filmmaker. And she's a very talented artist, mm -hmm. but she kind of had a breakdown in college. She had a break, you know, she's very psychological, like psychologically vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, ended up dropping out of college and living back at home with her parents, working in a supermarket, mm -hmm. drudgery, and mm -hmm. looking at the magazines every day. And who's on the cover of the magazine, but her former best friend. And so she's obsessively sort of cutting out the pictures of, of Elise and storing them under her bed in a way that's a little creepy. But um, and dreaming at night, she has these very vivid dreams that she considers yeah. to be prophetic. Right. And dreaming of reuniting with Elise. And it turns out her dreams are prophetic. She does reunite with Elise. Right. Their high school reunion. Right. And ends up going out to LA and sort of in ingratiating herself into Elise's life again and they do reunite so yeah and I do have a celebrity classmate who comes to all of our reunions and mm -hmm. it's always that but Laura was you know describing that frisson of recognition and just mm -hmm. yeah, a bit of spark in the air that comes mm -hmm. and celebrity in the midst and yeah. I wanted to channel that into something too so the glamorous lives of writers whose books are inspired in the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's where inspiration will hit. Right. These are books for women. These are books for, the, your books are for every woman who's ever looked at across the street or at her, you know, yeah. high school yearbook and said, and said like, 
why can't I be that person? Why can't I have that experience? Oh, her life must be fabulous, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm so fascinated that you all sort of, uh, with apologies to Mona, went down the rabbit hole. Uh, books, right? You go down this dark, you go down this dark side, you had to, you know, explore this aspect of life and of yourselves. Mm -hmm. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit, each of you, uh, about what the experience was like for you, writing this book and then bringing it into the world. So Laura, can we start, can we start with you? Sure. You know, I'm curious how much this, I mean, to the extent that writing a book is fun or not fun, or mm -hmm. wanting, right. you know, how much particular, spending all this time with this particular character, how that affected you, how that felt. I really loved being in her head. I mean, I have always written dark materials so my poetry books before this. So I'm pretty able at this point to separate and like, you know, in the moment when I'm writing this particular voice, I'm in there, yeah. but I can also put it aside so it doesn't like bleed into my very normal life, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but just, I mean, creating this character was so, I was really immersed in her voice. It was uh -huh. so powerful for me. And I think I, I think I wrote the first like 60 to 80 pages by hand, just in a rush, you know, oh. without thinking like, oh, what is this? What am I doing? I just followed the voice. So yeah. having that experience of being carried along by a voice was really fun. Um, yeah, there is a book out there <laughs> that I marked where I like, I just loved things. Oh, good. That's great. Your book was the scariest to me. Okay. <laughs> this sends into so much, you're like into, I would, I would. into so much mad, madness, you know, madness, and um, uh, you know, even in these dark times, I feel like it's it's kind of a relief to follow someone, and, and you look up from the book, you know, like, oh, like you said, like my life's pretty normal. Right. That's what I've always found about dark material. Like when I'm in a dark place, I watch horror films, uh -huh. and oh. I feel comforted. Oh you know, I don't want to watch happy stuff. I want to watch horror, wow. you, know, read, you know, read really dark books because it does provide this kind of release for you, I think. Um, so I'm glad that you had that experience. <laughs> wow, wow. So Mona, Mona, um, one of my favorite lines in your book is Samantha's workshop leader, right? She says, um, Samantha, do you know what a book should be? Every great book that is, Samantha, an axe. Mm. A book should be an axe. Mm. So um, can you sort of address that as well as this question of what it felt like for you writing this protagonist in this sort of uh, altered world um, and how it felt to you going down that rabbit hole? Yeah, I mean, it's it's... It's it's uh, it's interesting because you know it's it's a character who can't really she can't really draw those boundaries that Laura was just describing. Like as she is a writer too, yeah. and she can't draw boundaries between the real and the imagined. She lives in her head, and in her head, you know, um, she can spin very dark stories about what's going on around her, and she can actually live those dark stories. Right. Um, but she can also have these incredible moments of wonder and like magic, which she can also live. So it's just kind of like exploring how the imagination for somebody can be a really transformative space, but also a really horrific space. And I have to say that like, it was a trip. I loved, loved working on Bunny. It was like one of the greatest writing joys that I think I've ever had. Like it was terrifying. Yeah. Um, Yes, because it was so different. Um, and that's, I should really contextualize it. My first book was a book of realism, you know, about body image. And that was a real struggle for me to write. It took, you know, six years of rewriting and rewriting these stories. And it was painful material in a way that, yeah, Bunny deals with pain, but it deals with it differently um, yeah. using you know, fairy tale and, and fantasy to kind of work through pain. 
Yeah. Um, 13, 13 ways doesn't really do that. So yeah. it was, it was a kind of, it was a, that was a real like period where it was kind of writing was, um, was difficult. So bunny was like this kind of gift where I just sort of let myself have fun and yeah. I didn't know the outcome. And I was playing with, you know, magic and playing with fairy tale and playing yeah. with my interest in horror. I have that shared kind of interest with Laura too. And, um, and so it was really wonderful, but it was frightening and I never knew what was going to happen next. And I just oh kind of had God. You didn't so, know the satanic rituals were coming. You, oh my God. No, I mean, I knew some things. Yeah. Like, I knew that yeah. they were going to conjure men out of bunnies. And I yeah. knew, I knew the end. I knew the twist at the end. Yeah. Um, no but, but that's, yeah, no spoilers. Yeah, yeah no but, spoilers, no spoilers. Yeah. Your but, book really felt to me like the mo playing the most with reality. Right, yeah. you, you know, I would think I was in reality, and then I'd be like, "Wait, am I in a horror film?" Uh, you know, I right. I had trouble figuring out. I, I experienced your book as very meta. Um, mm -hmm. right? Like, I had trouble. I, I mean, I was with you all the time, but I was like, "What part is real? What part mm -hmm. is horror? What part?" Right. And and I I loved that about it. And you didn't mention her friend Ava. Her Ava, friend, yeah. she's Ava. very important who's so important and I loved her, this woman who basically shows up smoking a cigarette and saying to your protagonist, like, don't worry about those, you know. Bunnies. Bunny, <laughs> bunnies, right. Don't worry about those bunnies. You're much cooler than them. So I really, I really love that. Did anyone ever say to you, a book should be an ax, Mona? Well, it's a quote, um, you know, from, um, from Kafka that the, oh, right. you know, um, so, so, but I, I do think that, that yeah. a book can be that. And certainly in Bunny, um, people really do take an ax to their <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, so yes. books are actually dangerous, you know, in that way, they have that mm -hmm. kind of power, at least, you know, Samantha, because she can't, again, she can't make those kinds of distinctions between the real and the imagined. Exactly. Um, so it's very dangerous, yeah. 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 Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, Lauren, I, what I loved about your book, I loved the setting so much. I loved how she goes to LA and walks down Abikini and all of the, um, all of the, her experience of leaving behind one world and going into another world. Hmm. Um, uh, so for you also, you know, you fought, you take this impetus of envy, like you said, you're schlepping around your grocery bags, you know, and then you're like, Oh my God, that famous woman. Um, and then you just followed that. So what did that feel like for you and how much did you experience it as a joy and as a challenge um, going into this sort of darker journey, going on a dark journey with your narrator? Yeah, you know, it was it was a joy for me, too. It was uh -huh. it's um, it's also cathartic for yeah. me. Um, I think that all of us here, I mean, as writers, this is, uh, it's sort of, our characters are very similar. I, I, know, I was thinking about the three books and how all three of the narrators are creative people. Yeah. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they are mm -hmm. outsiders who create or imagine themselves into their own realities. And that's what we do all day. And this is why we do what we do because that is how we survive. <laughs> that's right. how we get through. Uh, Abby, is psychologically really uh, delicate and um, very strongly affected by darkness in the world that uh, really gets to her. She um, had a psychological breakdown, as I mentioned, as a younger woman and is really looking for a way to survive. And it's funny, when you asked what were her, what are the motivations of the characters, I almost want to say that Abby's motivation is survival. Yeah. She, um, the only way she can think of to get through life without completely falling apart is yeah. by making it up. Yeah. Making it up herself. She's an artist. She dreams up, uh, I mean, liter literally dreams in her mind, uh, these new, you know, her life and what the future will be. And, uh, and she creates it for herself. She, and, yeah. yeah. And she kind yeah. of feels like she has, she's not really living until she goes to LA. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. She wants to. Yeah. And again, there's that blurred line between 
uh, imagination and reality for her. Yeah. So that was, I put my, I mean, what I'm saying about the, the darkness that she sees out in the world, mm -hmm. I was seeing that very much while I was writing The Paper Wasp. I was really worried about what I saw happening out in the world and really affected by uh, the news and so many disasters and calamities. And um, my way of holding it together is by writing. Yeah. So, and so to have a character like Abby, I could throw all of my anxieties into this yeah. character and make her just a complete basket case. And it felt really good to create a character like that. Uh, and it's what um, what helps me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I loved the filmmaking. Is it? Um, I loved the film aspect in in your in your book. So is there a certain filmmaker who you were referencing? Uh, yeah, there's there's a famous reclusive <laughs> film director in the Paper Wasp who lives in Switzerland. Yeah, that is you know, and there are famous film directors who live in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, he also has created this sort of quasi cultish wellness film creative institute in the hills uh, of Malibu. Yeah, and. Um, and he is a very dark, weird filmmaker. Uh, so he's really, Auguste Perrin is his name. And uh -huh. he's, uh, he's a, 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 an amalgamation of a few different creative people I've thought of. But the filmmaker who was my inspiration, um, who I love very much and who scares me very much is David Lynch. Oh, oh so, my God. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And, the yeah. dream elements and all of this. This was um, sort of my own little personal homage to David Lynch. Oh, that's great. Living yeah. in a dream. And yeah. the, the rhizome, she goes to this yeah. um, yeah. retreat. Yeah. I right. loved the, the, the very taut line you walk between having that be a real experience and satirizing that experience. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I did. So you guys all wrote these books sort of after the 2016 election. Um, I mean, I was thinking they all come out in 2019, right? And mm -hmm. one of the questions that you proposed when you proposed the panel was, um, why are these outsider female narrators increasingly popular, right? And does this mark a significant shift in our representations of women in literature? And before we go to our, um, we have a lot of questions piling up from the audience, but I would love to ask you to address the, you know, your own question. Why? Why are these narrators becoming more popular? Um, I mean, we see it all the time and they're, they're so fun. They're very, they are cathartic to read. Mm -hmm. So um, Lauren, why don't we start with you? You know, what is your thought on that? Why these outsider narrators are increasingly popular? Well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that with our the three female narrator, yeah. narrators here. I think there are a few different elements at play. One of them is, I think, maybe maybe I'm projecting, but uh, the growing sense of frustration of being female in this society right now. Um, and you know, you mentioned the 2016 election, and I didn't really yeah. make this connection. Uh, so strongly until you mentioned that. And I always thought that it was, you know, all my, my anxieties about what the future would hold after the election are certainly in the book. But now that you mentioned it, I think that there is a certain amount of frustration seeing that, yeah. uh, again, there will not be a female president. Um, and just watching women be uh, frustrated and stymied in their attempts at becoming fulfilled or, or gaining positions of power or having agency. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I really wanted, I, you know, and my and Abby is a character who I really wanted to give her agency because in when I've written female characters before, they're often I, whether even if I don't mean for them to be, they're often very passive. Things are happening to them. Yeah. I wanted Abby to go and do something about it. Yeah. But at that, at the same time, she's still not. She never entirely. She and she does get what she's looking for. I won't give it away what that is. She seizes it, she takes it, she goes and she becomes what she wants to be, but it's pseudonymous. Right. It's not, she doesn't have her name imprinted on it. The only way that she can really have agency is undercover. Right. So, like, a lot of questions come up from that about uh, femalehood and power and... Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess 
addressing the question of how. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that weird echo. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, addressing the question of female power and what happens mm -hmm. when you try to, you know, when women use their own agency, how do we tap into our own agency, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I want everybody to answer the question. Mona, let's go to you. Uh, you know, this question of the darkness, the darkness that you guys are not so much, you know, creating on the page, but picking up from the world. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, uh, you know, the bunnies take matters into their own hands and kind yeah. of play God in the book. Um, you know, they're creating their own beings. They're actually creating life. Um, and they see that as a subversive act. You know, they're creating things that they can control. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, the way that the, their, their desires are being informed by the way that they've internalized, you know, our you know, capitalist, very misogynist world as well, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so I mean, I you know that that was really interesting to me. But feminine power and all the different shapes that it can take um, was something that Bunny was was really at the core of Bunny. That's what was exciting to me about the book was that yeah. I had not only a female antihero um, and not only this this friendship between Samantha and Ava, but that my antagonists were like these were these powerful women. I love villainesses in fiction so much. Like that's why I think I loved um, Laura's book and Lauren's book so much is because I just love that complicated villainess, you yeah. know, yeah. who's got layers to her. She's not just one note. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I, really, I wanted to explore those kinds of characters in, in my own fiction. Mm -hmm. You know, you raise an interesting point, Mona, which is, um, are all of your characters are going down a dark path, but they were not unlikable narrators. And I thought that was really an achievement for all of you that, um, that they're dark, but they're, it's not, I mean, you know, there are some of the unreliable narrator books that I've read where in the end, I'm just sort of angry at the character. Um, I'm angry that she's gotten away with what she's gotten away with her. And I didn't feel that with any of, you know, with any of your books. I felt this subtlety of struggling, you know, with the power uh, and with societal expectations as well. Mm -hmm. um, so Laura, uh, I want to give you a chance to also answer this question, you know, um, why this uh, increasingly popular focus on the unreliable or outsider dark mm -hmm. are there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I definitely do see it coinciding with 2016. I, I, and maybe everybody else started writing this book bef well before. Yeah. Um, for me, it was it were it was a strain I was picking up in other works of fiction that yeah. kind of, I think inspired me a bit. Like Elena Ferrante's Days of Abandonment was one yeah. that I read and was like just you know took my head off because I'd never read such an enraged, raw female narrator before. And it was exciting. And yes, she was mm -hmm. subtle and nuanced. And I think years later, I, I felt the need to like create my own version of that. And also what Lauren was saying about agency was very important to me. I feel like we've had centuries of books of women being done to and especially in books that uh, verge on like thriller or crime fiction in some way. And I wanted to create a woman who did some bad stuff, yeah. know, to be yeah. very simplistic about it, who did take her own agency into her hands and, and felt the power of that. But it's a, you know, complicated power and yeah, well, pretty. But I was really fascinated, and I'm still fascinated by that. Yeah, the idea yeah. of women's agency. Yes, yes, and you all you all do a beautiful job of really exploring that in a very very nuanced way. That's how I felt. So I'm gonna um, look at some of our our questions. Let's see. Um, how did Cynthia asks? How did each of you decide how you would describe what your lead character looked like? Hmm. I really like that. Hmm. Uh, and what her personality traits would be. Uh, did you imagine her as someone looking or being completely unlike you? Uh, I love that. Or were there similarities? So uh, whoever wants to take a stab at that question. I think that's such an interesting question, given the fact that um, 
there are female characters who are looking at other female characters, mm -hmm. yeah. lookers, you know? Yeah. They all start out with looking and obsessing mm -hmm. over the visuals of mm -hmm. other women. And I think, Laura, I was looking at an interview that you did and you mentioned the culture of looking, that mm -hmm. we have this culture of looking at especially at women and the gays and all that. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's an interesting question. And of course it has to be addressed in each of our books because we're so much about looking and about fem femininity. And um, I, I guess now I'm answering the question because I made a comment, but um, <laughs> that's okay. yeah. uh, for, for, for Abby, I, how did I decide what she would look like? Well, I did want her to look very different from her object of admiration. So Elise is a beautiful red haired, green eyed beauty. And I wanted Abby to be sort of the antithesis of that. And she and she is physically and literally dark, dark right. black hair, pale skin, like white, you know, pasty and, um, you know, sure, a little bit, um, a little chunky, not, you know, so, and she's self-conscious and not happy with her appearance. Right. And I thought that was sort of, that would be part of her, um, sense of sense of envy stems from yeah admiring really yeah so i did not model her on myself although i have dark hair and i'm short um <laughs> i don't know yeah. yeah uh i noticed that um in all of your books you know i think if i'm not mistaken that the the people who they envy the women who they envy are like blondes you know wispy mm -hmm. blondes, right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a societal expectation that you're pushing back against, which, mm -hmm. you know, I, although I'm blonde, I'm not tall and willowy, um, or am I really blonde actually? But, um, <laughs> so thank you. Does somebody else want to address that question about, um, how you decided what your character would look like? Yeah. Uh, or Mona, you want to go? No, I was just, I was going to say something about your book, actually. There's like this great scene where um, the narrator is in a restaurant and she thinks she looks wonderful and everybody's looking at her. Mm -hmm. And then like things just shift and no, nobody's like, like, I just, that made me really question her mm -hmm. self presentation in the book. Yeah. And, yeah. Like, look the way that she's told us she looks. Yes. And yeah. Yeah, I tried to be very minimal with describing her she does have like i think actually my narrator has blue eyes and blonde hair uh-huh i remember right i don't remember <laughs> um and the actress has this like auburn hair so oh. but i remember she had this beautiful this beautiful hair. Auburn hair. Yeah. but um but yeah i wanted to leave it a little bit minimal because of exactly what mona was saying is you know her perception of who she, what she looks like. She often says that she could be a movie star too. Like, so she either has this amazing sense of self or other moments she does not. So I wanted it to be something that could shift. So I, I tried to be very minimal in describing her. Yeah. So it could be fluid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did, Lauren, did you want to wait? Oh, um, Lauren, okay. Already won. Oh, sorry. I'm going to put it through your questions at the same time. Tell us about um, Samantha. Mm -hmm. Mona, tell us about Samantha. How does she? Oh, look? yeah. Samantha, I wanted to make her like not like the bunnies. The bunnies are super like hyper feminine in a very twee way, and they wear these like fit and flare dresses, and you know, they're just so cute. And um, that's really horrifying to Samantha. Uh, so she's a little bit more of a tomboy. You know, um, she's really one of her like distinguishing like features is that she's super tall and the bunnies are short. Yeah. And I had a lot of fun with that. The fact that they are terrifying to her, even though she's tall, <laughs> and they're like something small, powered, you know. Um, so she's kind of she's a bit of an awkward soul. Like I, that's kind of I think her her place in the world, how she feels in the world, and that's all you kind of get. I didn't want to fill her in too much because um, I wanted, I, I guess I did want readers to be able to sort of really be in her body and her head. So I didn't want to yeah. like nuance that body too, too much. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, okay. Here's a question. Since the election, misogyny has become more visible. Is mm -hmm. the way you portray your lead characters indulging this misogyny? Mm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, 
take a stab. I hope not. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I don't think so. I think I it's so. I guess the yeah. No. I think that they are too. All of these characters are too nuanced to be indulging. Yeah. The kind of misogynistic mm -hmm. portrayal. I think you know misogyny creates you know very two dimensional portraits of women and who we are and what we do. And none of these books does that. Right. And also these books um, are satires. It's hard to read. You're not reading them straight. You're reading them understanding that society has pushed these women in societal expectations mm -hmm. and pushed them to a place where they have to exercise, as we were saying before, their agency in um, sort of alarming ways. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I would, I would hope that if anything, that these three narrators would help to temper or reduce misogyny in that it's the first person narration demands that the reader is in the head of the main character and, mm -hmm. and, and forces that reader, whether they want to or not, to understand what it is to be that person mm -hmm. and what it feels like, why they make the decisions that they do. And so it may feel uncomfortable to be inside a sociopath's head, but because, or, or I won't say that they're sociopaths, that's a bit extreme, but um, some of them are uh, disturbed or disturbed <laughs> or, or <laughs> so somewhat, somewhat, uh, somewhat antisocial. Um, yeah. And to, to empathize whether it's easy to do or not. And so I think anytime, and this is what writing is about. I mean, ideally, this is why we read books is to uh, understand more fully other people, other lives and empathize. Mm -hmm. And if it's a bit difficult. And I think that to force readers, force is a strong word, to uh, ask readers to empathize with difficult women mm -hmm. it, or, or vulnerable or, um, or hurt or afraid or anxious women uh, or any women, mm -hmm. it would, idea will really hope to, I think, temper uh, misogyny that's out there, especially because there are women who are uh, making choices and, do, and, and having agency instead of just being a sort of cut out character that things are being done to, which as we talked about so many other books are. I think if anything is increasing misogyny, it's these books where the woman is the victim and everybody has to go and, you know, it's just the this continuing trope of victimhood and the missing girl and the girl in the lake and the dead girl and the drowned girl and everybody gets to you know imagine right. this no decapitated murdered girl yeah right we're the opposite of the decapitated woman right showing up on the side of the lake I think that's a really good point mm -hmm. almost as a response and I think yeah you really do capture it Lauren by saying empathy because we're in these women's heads we we understand where their pain the mm -hmm. source of their pain i mean i think they all did a really good job of showing the source of their pain right um let's see lauren i loved your character of elise and how i liked her less and less with each page nope. <laughs> but felt great sympathy for her as well by the end can you talk a bit about your intentions with her character? And that's a great dovetail off of the question we, we just answered. Mm -hmm. Well, she's being looked at. She's the example of the woman who's being, who's the ob object of everyone's admiration, envy, lust, hate, resentment, bitterness, everything. And she's a, a vessel for what everybody else puts on her, the lookers, yeah. and she's the looky, you know. Yeah. So it's really hard for her. You know, she's, you know, she starts out as this, um, you know, Abby sees her as this really, uh, you know, successful, everything is easy for her because she's beautiful and she's a starlet and roles are being offered to her. But then as we get to know her a little better, I, I was I was actually hoping that people would like her more rather than less. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Um, yeah. Even though Abby starts to have more problems with her as her facade is cracked and Abby's expectations of what they will be to each other are, are demolished. Uh, Elise, I think I tried to show how vulnerable she actually is and how, you know, worried and anxious she is in an industry that values women so much for their looks uh, in Hollywood. Yeah. And that as she is, you know, even though she's 
in her you know late twenties, uh, she's already feeling like she's getting old, and younger women are being given parts, and you know what's going to happen to poor Elise. Yeah, but I guess part of it is that Elise is not really seeing mm -hmm. your narrator and her what's happening to her, right? right. Maybe yeah. that's why she becomes increased because she's very self-absorbed. She's very self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. She's so yeah, self own concern. Yeah, absolutely. She's not really a good friend to our narrator. No, that's not her concern. Right, no. that is not her concern. Yeah, no. Wow, I just uh, oh here we go. Um, ask a question. Here we go. There's a lot of things to na navigate here. Okay, my husband and I were discussing this morning the connection between feeling like an outsider and the need to create. Is that the primary thing that drives your creativity or is it something else? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, all creative people feel marginalized to some extent and that that can be a motivating force for sure. It's like our way of having a voice in society mm -hmm. and I, you know, definitely feel, and I feel like outsiders have this incredible status in society where, yeah, we are outside of it, outside of the mainstream and looking at it and can have this interesting perspective that can reveal things that maybe if you're a bunny <laughs> or if you're, you know, in the mainstream um, of everyday life, you can't necessarily see. Yeah, you can't get that. Right. I don't know that I'd say that's what drives my creativity completely, but it's definitely something that I feel. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a that question. Are we all outsiders? Are writers more outsiders? Do we feel it or do we just express it? Sorry, Mona, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, I was just thinking, yeah, I think I think that was that was a factor for me too. Um, especially with my my first book, you know, I, I was it was just as somebody who kind of struggled with body image and, you know, all my life, I really wanted like people to understand what that, what it might be like to occupy that sort of, um, that sort of body or that sort of perception of one's body. Mm -hmm. And also um, to, 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 uh, to write for that person who might be looking for that um, experience in a book, you know, mm -hmm. like somebody mm -hmm. actually kind of, um, documenting what that might what that might be like um, to have that connection with with uh, with that kind of reader I really wanted that um, but then with Bunny I think you know it was the same sort of impetus it was exactly what Laura was saying it was like giving voice to somebody who would otherwise not maybe not have one and looking through their eyes and then trying to see how they might see the world and um, you know, it's it's always exhilarating to give voice to somebody who is kind of more whispering to you on the side, you know, mm -hmm. rather than in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. So much more interesting. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, those are the people I like to be friends with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and I think for me, the outsiderness is is what drives my creativity for sure. I think for mm -hmm. since I was a kid, I always felt like I was different, and that I didn't get the same memo that everybody else got. Um, and I couldn't really put my finger on why that was. Um, but I always felt that I was outside looking in and observing everyone else and sort of taking notes uh, from from childhood. Uh, and I, I, I think that, who was it that just said in, in this panel just now about that, that outsiders were all outsiders on the inside? Is that a quote from who said that? Did you say that, Mona RuPaul? I think I said RuPaul, that, yeah. RuPaul, I, oh, I yeah. absolutely love it because I really think it's true. I think that um, that we all are outsiders on the inside and mm -hmm. everybody thinks that they're being looked at funny maybe or that they're weird and you know trying to fit in. Um, and I like to give that interior self-consciousness to all of my characters, even if they yeah. seem like, you know, even, even like I have a PTA mom who totally fits in with the, you know, she's got all the kids and she's, you know, fits in with the town. This is my previous book. Yeah. And but inside she feels different mm -hmm. and yeah. struggling. And we're all struggling to see, to try to be human. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I love, I, but I loved my very favorite characters to write are the, are the freaky outsiders. And there are almost, so many of them are artists or. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's great. It's a great, I think our hour is just about up. 
Um, I have a lot more questions here. I think I would just like to ask you guys to finish up by um, maybe responding to what influences you can um, you know, refer to. Uh, one of the questions was, these are very female books, but were you influenced by any male writers? Um, and maybe what you're, what's, what's next for you? So let's start with Laura. Um, your influences, men or women, uh, maybe a book that you're reading now, and then what's next for you? Okay. Um, okay, all those. Um, well, I was thinking of, I've been very influenced by film as well as, as books, and, and Hitchcock is a huge influence. You know, I grew up watching Rear Window like on repeat. Yeah. <laughs> many times so he has been a huge influence in my in my writing life um and just film in general like i feel like i'm a very visual writer um so film in general i love david lynch also mm -hmm. a huge huge influence and and then in terms of books i do tend to be more i feel like i have a more intimate connection sometimes with women writers or i have lately especially um so again reading days of abandonment elena ferrante that was a huge um influence on looker as was uh jenny ofel's department of speculation yeah. where i saw that this could be a novel too because coming from poetry i was intimidated by you know write the idea of writing some 500 page tome yeah like, normal, strict flowing narration. So when I read her book, I felt it kind of freed me to be like, oh, this this is a novel too. Yeah. Like yeah. A collage, collage like structure that she yeah. has. And um, I'm trying to, one book that I loved recently, I'm not reading it right now, but um, is The Dry Heart by Natalia Ginsburg. It's like a novella. And it starts with a woman shooting her husband between the eyes. <laughs> you have a funny way of relaxing, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> and uh, you have something in the pipeline, right? Yes. Yes. So Look very for different, but similar. Very different from, but similar to Looker. <laughs> so good. <laughs> what's your title? It? Yeah. What's that's your working awesome. title, Laura, for your next book? Um, it's called Nice Women. So actually it has oh, so a lot to do, Lauren, with what you were talking about, like, oh, the PTA mom who also right. has, you know, she has issues and complexities and thoughts. And so it's it's six six characters. Six oh. nice women characters. Oh, fun. That yeah. sounds great. It's a novel, is that right? It's a novel, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Lauren, how about you? Um, influences, female or male, um, something that has been that you're reading and uh, maybe what and what's next for you? Uh, well, let's see. The first female influences that come to mind for as writers, uh, I guess I would say Flannery O'Connor is one. Uh, I love Donna Tart. Yeah. And um, yeah, I love Virginia Woolf, although I don't think she's an influence really. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe a little bit, but and for men, I, uh, David Lynch, like I mentioned, yeah. and um, you know Nabokov, I think, is also an, an influence. And on what I write, um, on my outsiders in particular. Yeah, uh, I just finished War and Peace. It took five months. Uh, oh my God. It's my pandemic book. I was like, this is it, I'm doing it. And yeah, it was like five pages a night, but yeah. it's fabulous. It's I love it. oh my God. what I needed to just completely lose myself in Russia and not be here. Um, and what's next for me? I have a new book that I just finished a revision of. And um, yeah, at, the, at that, it's working title is The Hundred Waters. And mm -hmm. it's, love that. That. You like that title? I hope. Mm -hmm. Hundred waters. Hundred waters. Again, I have an. It's an outsider artist. A couple right. of them. Um, one sort of a frustrated art photographer who is a middle-aged woman in the suburbs, and a teenage boy who is uh, an aspiring artist who is quite troubled, 
and uh, troubles her life. Oh, wow. And so it's another it return to the suburbs for me. Right, right. It's where I live, where I grew up, and what I know. Sounds great. Yeah. Sounds really good. Thanks. Thank you. And Mona, what yeah. influences, what's next? Yeah. OK, um, so influences, I would say the big uh, female influence for me would probably be Shirley Jackson uh, oh, for Bunny. Yeah. Uh, love Hangs a Man, love um, the, the Haunting of Hill House. It's just so brilliant, the way she plays with imagination and reality. I um, mean, so creepy, um, just love her. And uh, for men, David Mitchell is just oh, yeah. my favorite. He's like a method actor writer when it comes to first person, you know, like he can just completely inhabit somebody's yeah. head and make you believe that you're really in that person's like body looking yeah. through the of their eyes, the way he does voice. So I always go back to him and I love Slade House because it plays with um, horror and there's supernatural elements to it. So Slade House was a big one for, for Bunny. What I'm working on now or what I just finished um, is a book called All's Well, and it's coming out um, in August of 2021. Um, and it's uh, it's about a uh, a theater um, teacher, a drama drama teacher who has chronic pain, and she's directing this uh, very mutinous undergraduate production of All's Well that ends well. Um, and her students hate her, and they want to put on Macbeth, but she doesn't want to. Um, so she strikes this dark bargain so that her show goes on. Um, and then she lives Macbeth off stage. Oh my God. Very meta, again, really meta for you. I love it. Yeah, I don't know about meta, but no, it's, no. it's definitely okay. playing around with Shakespeare for sure. Um, yeah. And then, um, I, what was the last question? Um, or, oh, what are you reading? What have you been oh, reading? Um, so I'm teaching a class on fairy tales. Um, right now. So I'm reading a lot of fairy tales. Uh, and a book that I'm revisiting is Boy Snow Bird by Helen Oyeyemi. Mm -hmm. It's a retelling of Snow White. Um, it's it's great. I highly recommend it. That sounds great. That sounds yeah. great. Okay, Laura, Lauren, and Mona, thank you guys so much. Thank you to our audience. Guys, um, audience, you can buy the author's books by going to the little buy the author's books here button. And thank you for being here. Thanks for being great panelists. I had a lot of fun with you guys. And thank you. Thank you for the great question, Lori. Thank, thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>